Exciting news, our YouTube channel offers tier one membership, granting exclusive access to over 100 hours of never released Christian International video archives and more. Join the community by clicking the join button below to support us and unlock these incredible perks. Praise God, you may be seated, thank you. It's good to be with you today. How many have enjoyed the morning so far? I think they did a wonderful job. Edgar did a great job of bringing us that impact of uh, church planters and city builders. And Apostle Jane, of course, did a usual wonderful job of having us hook into what God has for us, especially Jubilee and what he's doing in this season. How many are striving to do that, right? Get that hook in there, right? So I'm going to talk about something totally different. No, it's going to be pretty close. Uh, it wouldn't be unusual for me to talk about something totally different, but I want to talk about the army of the Lord. Now, for those of you who, who know me, how many have heard me speak before? So none of my jokes are going to be good. Okay, so, so if you've heard me before, you know that my take on things is sometimes a little different than, than most people's. And uh, God speaks to me where I'm at. I'm, I'm at a place of, uh, I was a geek. Still I'm kind of. Uh, I like science and math and technology and those kinds of things. And I was an engineer, as you heard uh, my brother Tom talk about my, my life. Uh, I was an engineer for about a decade. All my training was in that before I moved to the ministry. So I think that way. And so that's the way the Lord speaks to me. How many are wonderfully appreciative of the Lord speaking to you the way you understand? Amen. Right? He's good at that. So I appreciate that about God. So one of the things you do is, if you're my mindset is you ask dumb questions. I ask lots of dumb questions like, what? Does, it, does that really mean what you think it means? What is he talking about? I ask those questions all the time. So when I hear about the army of the Lord, and my dad's in the midst of writing a book about it uh, right now, um, I ask myself questions like, do I know what that means? What, what is it about? Why should I care? Right? <laughs> so the Lord spoke to me about some things, and uh, this isn't obviously all revelation on the army of the Lord, but this is my, my beginning steps in understanding. Before we talk exactly about the army of the Lord and, and what it means, I need to set a little bit of foundation. Now, I am assuming that all of you are students of the word. Say amen. amen. So, uh, just a touch of what I'm going to say which should just open up vistas to you, and you, you, all your encyclopedic knowledge will tie in to hook in to what God is saying, all right? So, I'm going to start in Matthew chapter 20. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version this morning. And this is the, Jesus speaking to the disciples in verse 25. And it said, Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So that's a pretty well-known verse, and you've all, I'm sure, heard it before. There's another version of this in Luke. And uh, the key note here I'm, uh, that I want to bring to light is that Jesus said he came to serve, to be a servant. Uh, John relates it through the washing of the disciples' feet, that Jesus came to serve, uh, to be our servant. And so... Uh, let's look at another verse. I'm going to look at several verses here in a row, so if you can either take notes or read the verses, probably not both. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 uh, says this, 1 Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is at hand. How many think that might be true? Therefore, be self-controlled. Wow, I didn't know that's what I was supposed to do. Be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Oh, that's interesting. That's not the subject today, but I like that verse. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly 
Since love covers a multitude of sins, show hospitality to one another. I don't really like that verse very much. Without grumbling. And I don't do it very well. Each of us has received a gift. Okay, so we all have a gift. Use it to serve one another. Do you see that? You have gifts. Their purpose right here is to serve one another as good stewards of God's grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks of the oracles of God, or in other words, speaks for God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. So notice here, there's only two types of things he's talking about. He's, he's condensed it all down to two types of things. Everyone has a gift. He doesn't say what the gift is. But he says, here's the two ways you use gifts. Supernaturally, speak like the oracle of God. And naturally, serve others. Now, those can be combined. You can serve others supernaturally. But notice the two emphasis. One is supernatural to speak the or- the, as the oracle of God. The other is more natural, more pragmatic to serve one another, to love one another. That's the emphasis he's putting into it. If you do these two types of things in order that, that everything in God may glorify Jesus Christ. So if you want to glorify Jesus Christ, you need to both be supernatural and natural. You need to both speak as the oracle of God, and serve, like Jesus did when he washed the disciples' feet, serve them. So we want to be, that's what Jesus is like. That's what it's telling us, right? We want to be like Jesus. That's what Jesus is like. He came as a servant. I'm sure many of you have, can think of many other verses along the same theme. Just one little note here uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1. It talks about waging a good warfare with the prophecies that were given over you. Everybody know that verse? So that tells me that prophecy is a weapon of war. Because you only wage war with weapons. Right? So prophecy. So if you go back to 1 Peter, then when he says this is one category, prophecy, he doesn't, he's not narrowing it down to the gift of prophecy, but just to be prophetic, to speak for God, is warfare. That's why when we do warfare, we do things like praise and worship and prophecy and declarations and prayers, intercessions. All these things are speaking for God. It's the voice of God. It's all that. That's all the supernatural. It's coming to bring signs, wonders, and miracles. And all those things are associated with the voice of God. And that's warfare. It then goes on in 1 Peter and says the other category is service. Service is to people. That's what, that's what Matthew told us, to serve one another to love one another. You're given gifts to help others. So these two elements of warfare against evil and service for people. See see the elements there as they go together. So then to move on, in Genesis 127, it says that we're made in God's image. Now we know we were made in God's image. Everyone was. That's how man was made. But then we had some problems. I'm speaking we in the general sense. Uh, mankind had some problems. Sin came in and started to distort the image of God in us, right? How many think that's true? So we come now to the New Testament is helping us out with that now, Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So this is a mission statement. Do you hear the mission statement? God says, I'm going to make everything work for your good. You know what your good is? To be conformed to the image of God, of Christ. Did you know that was a good thing? I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm saying it's the good thing. All things work together for our good. And here's the good it's all working together for. To conform you to the image of Christ. That's what's good. You thought it meant something else, didn't you? Because I've used this scripture a lot to say, oh, I didn't like what happened, but I know it'll work together for my good. And I was thinking prosperity, health, safety, you know, all the good things. And I'm not saying those are wrong. I'm saying that's not the point. The good thing is to conform you to the image of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 17 says it this way. 
Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. How many heard that from Apostle Jane this morning? The liberty. And we all, with an unveiled face, behold the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image. So we, we see the glory of the Lord. Some, sometimes Scripture just grabs you. You, know, you don't know what to do with it sometimes. He's saying, look, I'm not just saying you're looking at me. I'm saying you're looking at my glory. And I'm going to conform you to that image, the image of my glory. How many want to be the glory of the Lord? I mean, that's a, that makes you think a little differently about what he's talking about. We behold the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image, one degree of glory to another. So when it says from going glory to glory, it doesn't mean you're, you are moving from place to place. It means the glory is building in you. Right? You're becoming more and more the image of Christ's glory. Okay? So if we want to be the image of Christ, the earlier verses I quoted you or showed you said that Christ's main Mode, his main image, his main projection is as a servant, right? That's his primary projection to us, is to serve us. He ultimately did that by laying down his life as the ultimate service, right? So on the one hand, we, want, we see Jesus as in his, in his role wanting to be a servant. And in the next set of verses, we see we want to be like him, in a very significant way. Therefore, it must mean that we should also want to be servants, right? Servants of God, at least. Maybe servants of more than that. Let's look at a few verses just to confirm this. I'm still laying the foundation. Everybody's okay. Revelation 1.1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. 1 Timothy 4, 6, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. John 12, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life will lose it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, did you know this whole thing was about serving God? If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, he will be my servant also. So if you want to serve Jesus, you have to follow him. That's a way of conforming to his image, is to walk in his footsteps, to do what he did, go where he goes, right? And it says that a good servant goes where the master goes, does what the master does. It, the servant becomes like the master. And it says, if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. How many want to be honored by the Father? It's a very easy recipe for that. Just serve Jesus. So what does serve mean? You know what the word serve means? It means to do what they want. If a server comes up to you in a restaurant and serves you, they do what you want. They bring you the food you order. They take care of you. right? So ultimately, service just means to do what you want or need. So when you start doing whatever God wants, how do you know what he wants? You have to be able to hear his voice, right? So that's why hearing his voice of God is always critical and, and, and necessary to all these situations. I'm trying not to get diverted, okay? <laughs> I'm trying to go through. The, I'm still laying foundation. It's hard, you know, because you keep seeing things you want to say. Okay, so I think you're getting it. In fact, the very word minister, the way, the way we use like we're a minister, everybody knows the term. In English, the word minister is a translation of the word diakonos, which is where we also get the word deacon. And it literally means servant. So if you're a minister of Christ, of the gospel, or anything like that, it means you serve it. That's what it means. In fact, when we come to church, we call the episode of the church we call a service, right? You're going to go to a church service. Ever, anybody ever think about that, why it's called a service? Or do you just go with it? Most people just go with it, right? But not me. I ask questions. Why do we call it a church service? It does, it's not, not intuitive exactly what's going on right there. But the reason it's called a church service historically is because it was an opportunity to explicitly serve God. 
by coming into his house or worshiping him, by doing what he said what he wanted us to do, right? As a good servant, we're doing what we're told to do. So when we do that, we're doing it in his service, right? And so we come to church to do his service. Make sense? Okay, so all that's foundation. Then I came to the one verse I was, got the questions about. First Corinthians chapter 6. I always get questions about verses. That's how it works for me. Got to answer those questions. Starting in the middle of uh, verse 2, 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. But put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found in your ministry or service. But as servants of God, we can demand ourselves in every way. So another, another, another servant verse, right? But look at the first part there. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. That's a paraphrase of Isaiah 61. This is the year of favor of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. It's, it's being paraphrased right there. That this is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. It's, it's the same meaning. That is a reference, a direct reference to Jubilee. I didn't make this up. I'm, I'm t every commentary agrees. I had to double check it to make sure. The first part of Isaiah 61, that first few verses, is a direct reference to the year of Jubilee. Any Israeli at the time would have immediately recognized it. This passage here in 1 Corinthians is also a, a reference to that same verse, therefore a reference to Jubilee. It's it's an amazing to me then that Jesus introduces his ministry with this verse. He uses Isaiah 61 to introduce himself to the world as a minister of God, right? That's in Luke chapter 4. He's essentially saying, look, this is about Jubilee. And then he says, I'm here fulfilling this verse. See, you could, you could say he's saying, I'm telling you, I'm Jubilee. Yeah, right. wow. yeah. That is good. Yeah. Jubilee. We're, we're all the things. You heard Apostle Jane talking about it this morning. Jubilee, uh, liberty, freedom, prosperity, healing, uh, reconciliation, all the things that come out of Jubilee. And we're in a year of Jubilee. But we really had Jubilee all along. I know there's special times, and I, I honor that, but really, we've been a part of Jubilee since we got saved, because Jesus said, I came to be that. I came to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. All the things that Jubilee is about, I came to do that. So here's, everyone now has forgotten completely the subject of my talk. There's two elements of Jubilee. You heard Pastor Jane uh, mention the word terroir, or the root word ruah, which is, I have a message I do about that. It's, a, it's, it's about a sound from heaven. And this sound has two meanings that are coinc coincidental. They're, they go together. The two meanings are joy, rejoicing, like you saw in the book of Ezra, where they had the celebration and they rejoiced, that's the, the Ruah sound. And then you see the battle, a war, like you saw in Jericho, where they shouted the Ruah and the walls came down. It has both elements, war and joy, two things we don't normally put together naturally, right? But Scripture does, God does. So I'm interested now, having developed this idea that we want to be servants of God because that's what Jesus said we were going to be like him and so on. And somehow this is connected to Jubilee because that's how he said he, his ministry is and we're going to be like him. We're going to follow him, do what he does. What do we have to know about Jubilee? Well, I think we get the joy part. Everybody likes freeing the captives, healing the brokenhearted, speaking the 
gospel to the poor, all those kinds of things. We kind of get that. But what about the other part? There's another part of Jubilee. It's the day of vengeance. It's about battle. It's the same word. The word Jubilee means a battle cry or a shout of rejoicing. They mean the same thing. Now, that took me a little while to get my mind wrapped around because I don't see them as the same naturally. It doesn't go together that way for me. How many think that's not exactly how you would have thought of it? Yeah, so, but I realized something. You know, there's a truth to it that finally came to me, and that is if you're winning, battle's great. I mean, you watch a football game. At the end of the football game, you have 11 guys on each side at least. You know, and they're, they're one group of guys and another group of guys in two different uniforms. And they've expended exactly the same energy. They both work the same hardness. They've, they've sweated. They've, they've hit. They've, they've, they've battled, right? And football is a surrogate for combat in our, in our culture, right? So at the end of the game... One group of guys who have worked their heart out are dragging themselves off the field, exhausted. The other group of guys who did the same thing are dancing and enjoying going to parties. And, right? They did the same thing. What's the difference? One of them won. The other one lost. There's always joy in the battle if you're winning. Okay, so there's battle. That was extra. There's battle. So what do we know about battle? Well, one thing I do know about battle is that battle is done by soldiers. So we've, we've established that we're to be servants of God. Let's see if we can establish that we're also to be soldiers. Let me give you a few verses. 2 Timothy 2, 1. And then, you then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me... In the presence of many witnesses, entrust the faithful man who will be able to teach it to others also. There's our reproducing. Share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. That's interesting because it now makes a soldier sound a lot like a servant, doesn't it? A servant's whole job is to please the master. And now it's saying a soldier's job is to please the one who enlisted him. Philippians 2.25 says it this way. I have thought it necessary to send you my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier. So he's both a worker or servant and a soldier. Philemon 1.1 1, 1 says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and to these others, our fellow soldier. Again, servant, worker, soldier. Ephesians chapter 6, that we all know, describes the armor that we're supposed to put on every day, right? Put on the armor of God. Everybody knows Sunday school? Got the armor of God. It's interesting to me. Things are interesting to me, and I'm really only interested in things that are interesting to me. It's interesting to me that Paul describes our armor as Christians using a Roman model. That's not intuitive to me. If you're going to describe Christians as armored warriors, why wouldn't you describe them as traditional Jewish soldiers, soldiers of Israel? Because they're different models. They have different ways of working. They have different. Um, the Jewish armies of that era were clan based, they were built around tribes. You, know, you can see this when David builds his army, there's some from this tribe, there's some from that tribe. That sometimes they specialize in certain weapons and so on, but they were built around family groups, around tribes. Roman didn't build its arms that way. It was just enlistment, more like a modern army, more just enlistment, and then you became part of the legion. The legion became your, your family. You were dedicated to them. That's who you marched with. Israeli armies didn't really march. They gathered, they went, they moved, but they didn't really march. Romans went rank and file, right? Form a square, move forward under command. And Paul uses that with their day modern army 
as their reference point rather than their traditional Jewish army. Anybody ever think of that? I didn't either until I started looking at this. It's like, wait a minute. What kind of warrior are we supposed to be? Surely, certainly we're not supposed to be modeled after Rome. Shouldn't we be modeled after Israel? How many think you would have rather been modeled after Israel? But no, not. We're modeled after Rome. Because he's trying to teach us something. Put, don't, you know, march together. Don't harm one another. Be in, be in coordinated with the, with the commanders. He's got all these lessons he's about to bring to bear. And they don't work in the ancient Israeli army. They work in the Roman army. So I got to thinking, if that works then, could it work again? So I got to thinking about our modern army. Now, fortunately for me, I have a friend who's well, very well experienced in the modern American army. Sitting right back there on the right-hand side. A lifer. Yes. A Mustang came up through the ranks uh, and from an enlisted person to a colonel. Long, a long service in the army. So I consulted with this expert and I found out some things about the military that I didn't really know. I maybe had some inkling about some of them, but not really. So let me tell you some of my observations about the army. The first thing you might want to notice is that if you're in the army, you're said to be in the service. In fact, we call military personnel servicemen, right? That got me thinking, why do we do that? Why do we call them servicemen? There's lots of other people who could be called service in a service or who serve. But the army specifically is called the service and I'm going to use army to mean the military, okay? So don't get too narrow for me here. The army means the service. And so, according to Colonel Linda, the primary value in the army from day one, from the first day of boot camp, is selfless service. Anybody here served? So you identify with that. They indoctrinate you that you're here to serve, even if it means your life. Right? It, it's 100% commitment. It's your whole being. It's going to affect not just you. It's not a nine to five. You're there all the time. You're always what you are. You're a serviceman, servicewoman. If the call comes, it doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing, what, what, what you wanted to do, what you meant to do, what you hope to do. It doesn't matter. You, you serve. It's because of this commitment, this whole heart, mind, soul, family, money, Everything is committed to that service. As long as you're in that army, that army is your life. It takes over your whole life. You even have to live in army quarters, eat army food. Everything's the army way. You may have thought you knew how to make a bed until you joined the army. <laughs> then you found out there's an army way to make the bed. And it's the only right way to make a bed as long as you're a soldier. As long as you're a soldier, there's only one right way. That's the army way. I found out also that there's a book. It's called The Uniform Code of Military Justice. And this book describes the framework under which military personnel operate. It gives guidelines. It gives the boundaries. It gives the, the principles by which you can and cannot do things. Everything in your military life, in the Army, is constructed on the foundation of that book. If it doesn't match that book, you don't do it, no matter who orders you to. Because the book is first. You can't say, oh, I did that because the guy who's above me ordered me to do it. You say, well, that's okay, except it doesn't match the book. If it doesn't match the book, 
The orders are no good. All the orders in the military, in the army, originate with the commander-in-chief. The commander-in-chief has set some purpose, goal, whatever he wants it to happen. Everything that flows down from that starts from there. If you can't hear your orders, you can't perform your function as a soldier. Everything happens based on your orders, as long as it falls within the confines of the book. Within the confines of the book and under orders, as an officer in the military, you have amazing powers. You can call in airstrikes. You can manipulate satellites. You can, you can move troops from here to there, put people in harm's way. As long as you're cooperating within the book and under orders. Once you're within the book and under orders, you're expected to use all your authority and every possible power to accomplish your mission. It's supposed to take all of you, your imagination, your intuition, your, your training, your, your resources, everything you have goes into accomplishing the mission as long as you operate in the confines of the book under orders. Within that confine, you have all power and authority to do whatever you need to do. But don't step out of that. As long as you can hear the orders and know the book, you can do whatever you have to do. And I found out the military practices their weapons. Did you know this? I knew this already, but I hadn't thought about it. We live near an Air Force base, not too far from here, called Eglin. And it's one of the biggest military bases in the nation. And uh, they sometimes practice. Jets fly over, you hear sonic booms, you see them doing their dance up in the sky. And sometimes they fire weapons from ships to shore. Uh, in fact, there's a, a news story just recently about recovering a Tomahawk missile that had gone astray and they had to go get it and pick it up and take care of it. But they don't practice at full power. You know, typically they're shooting blanks or, or shooting less than what you might face in combat, but it sounds like combat, so it helps you understand what's going to happen. Or they're firing missiles, but the missiles aren't armed. They don't have the actual explosives in them. Or, or, or some, there's not, you, don't, you don't have full power during practice. In order to see the full power, there has to be an enemy. You only see full power when you confront the enemy. And then you need full power. You need every gun to go off with a bullet that goes straight. You need every bomb to burst with as much power as it can hold. You need every plane to hit the right target. Full power all the way, that's the way to go. Because your mission is to destroy the enemy. Right? So if you want to see full power, stop practicing, engage the enemy. Now there are various branches in the armed service, I think you probably know that. They don't all get along, typically. Uh, Army guys are sometimes not that friendly with Navy guys and things like that. Unless they're at war. If, if, they're, if, they're, if they're stateside and they're at peace, they have all these little antagonisms and barbs and fistfights occasionally and things like that. But you put them on the front line, all that evaporates. And now they're not worried about whether you're wearing a blue version or the green version. Or they just want to know you have the right uniform on. Because they're depending on you to do your job and you're depending on them to do their job. Whatever that service is. Because when we do it together, we win. We can't afford to be 
kidding each other and fighting each other and saying we're better, you're not so good. We can't do any of that when we're in the battle. True unity occurs when we're in the battle. Every soldier is trained to fight. Everybody goes through basic training. It's all the same. You know, some of these soldiers are going to be cooks. Some of them are going to be clerical workers. Some of them are going to be officers, some non-commissioned officers. They're going to do all kinds of jobs. They're going to drive trucks. Some are going to pilot drones. Uh, all kinds of things. But they all go through one thing the same. They learn to fight. Every soldier, no matter where he is, you might be cooking potatoes right now, but if the, if the commander comes in and says, we need you, you pick up your weapon and you fight. And you let those potatoes go. You don't say, oh, no, no, I don't do that. I'm just a cook. You know, we talk about this some, sometimes. Our traditional way, I've heard my dad say it. There's a preaching division and a paying division and the, what's the other one? Three divisions. Preach, pain, praying. praying, okay. And that's okay. I mean, I understand where we're going with that. It's like, you know, the, we tend to emphasize certain things in our life, in our ministry. We tend to focus on something. But they're all army. It's not, they're not different just because their job is different. The job has nothing to do with battle. You do your job, but you fight if you need to. Remember the Iraq War, some of the earliest combat casualties were truck drivers. You think, wow, I, I'm just part of that division. I just drive trucks for the frontline soldiers. If there's no front line. There's just where you're called. And wherever you're stationed, wherever you're at, you're a soldier there. Doesn't matter where you think the front line is. Because the enemy doesn't honor front lines. He just tries to kill, steal, and destroy. When dealing with the enemy, the army credo is to defeat the enemy with all the power they have. Who's our enemy? Anybody know who our enemy is? The devil, right? It's princes, the palaces of the air, powers of darkness, evil, not people, right? People are not the enemy. There other religions have that concept, but we don't. So we don't believe people are the enemy. And this is the way, in the military terms, this would be the civilians, right? So when you engage the enemy, you do your best to not harm the civilians. In fact, you serve them if you possibly can. You've seen pictures of this, I'm sure, the... the Marine coming out of the smoke with a child in his hands. He was there with a gun to kill people, right? But only the enemy. Everyone else he's there to serve. In a way, he's serving the enemy too, right? Our service is the enemy to, to destroy them. <laughs> this is much like 2 Corinthians chapter 10 where it says, we're waging war but not according to the flesh, not natural, our, our weapons are warfare are not natural or, or against people, but they're powerful to destroy strongholds, spiritual things. Army people typically live on military bases, right? especially if they're near any combat zones. You know that a military base has all elements of culture? It has shopping and post office and medical and... Everything you can think of in a town is on a base. It's just all army. So the army can replicate and influence entire culture. I mean, you can look at what our, just a little town out here called Fort Walton Beach. They were struggling, having a problem. The 7th, uh, 7th Brigade, I might not have the right term, we got transferred to our base. 
brought a whole new influx of people and finances and turned the whole city around because the army showed up. Not the usual thing you think of it doing, but that's what happened. So what are we talking about? What are we talking about? We're talking about the army of the Lord. We have, you know, typically Christians, and I'm the same you know, until I start thinking things through, at least I, I have the same inclination, is to mystify everything, is to make everything, whoo, right? So we say the army of the Lord, and we have this vision of David and swords and shields, and, and then, you know, we don't know what to do with it because none of us has ever picked up a real sword probably, and shields are real, way heavy. If you ever picked up a shield, it's heavy. It's, you know, we didn't know what to do. So I'm asking God, what, what are we talking about, army of the Lord? And this is what I got. Service. I've called you to serve me in whatever I need you to do. And you do it my way. You do it my way. You do it with my authority on my book. When you hear your orders from me and you know you're safe on the book, then you have all power and authority you need to do whatever it takes to defeat the enemy that is evil, the devil, and to serve the civilians, the people. That's a little easier to understand for me. I like things simple. That's the engineer in me, right? Keep things simple. I can serve God. I can do what he asked me to do. And if I can do that his way, maybe I am the army of the Lord. The problem is maybe we don't have people actually listening to orders. Maybe we have people who don't understand the framework of the book who haven't practiced with their weapons. We have issues that the army is suffering from, but they can all be resolved. And maybe that's what he's talking about. We're going to resolve some problems, and my army is going to work. Now, there's something interesting, again, for me, that there's, a great, there's two kinds of wars right now. There's, there's two phases, basically, in my interpretation. There's the air war and there's the ground war. And the air war is all about changing the climate of the situation. Where you have enemy fighters and enemy missiles and a lot of enemy activity. If you put the air war out, you're basically trying to suppress the powers of the air. You're taking out their missile batteries. You're taking out their, their air force. You're taking out their command and control structures. You're, you're hitting the enemy in its highest level. You're taking it, you're building a no-fly zone. My dad sometimes says that when we talk about this. A no-fly zone, I mean, not meaning you don't fly, it means they don't fly. Because they know if they get up there, they're going to get shot down, right? So by creating a no-fly zone, you're changing the climate, the atmosphere under which the war is being prosecuted. The war is being prosecuted in you know, you might be winning, we might not be winning, but if you get a good air campaign, it changes ev everything about what you can do, what you can't do, Amen. right? But you don't take territory with the air war. You don't take any territory. Territory is only taken when you put boots on the ground. You can prosecute the air war as long as you want and you'll effectively hurt the enemy and change the climate but if you don't put any boots on the ground they'll just spring back up when you're done but to change the territory you have to put boots on the ground to me this is a clear illustration of these two aspects we've been talking about the supernatural the the prophetic the the declaration, the prayer, all these things, that's the air war. The ground war, for me, is seven mountains. We have to put people on the ground in that territory that we're not controlling, we're only suppressing. We're suppressing the enemy, but we're not controlling the ground. 
Until we get people on the ground, we can't control the territory. That's why now we're hearing about the army of the Lord. That's why now you're hearing about seven mountains. Why, why this is the message of the day, because he's saying, look, if you want to really change your territory, you've got to get people there. You've got to get people in that culture, in that place, in that society, in that group, in that... You've got to have soldier doctors, soldier lawyers, soldier educators, soldier politicians. Because when you put them on the ground... You change the territory. You become an occupier. You cannot be a regime changer with just shock and awe. You have to put boots on the ground. And when you do, then you'll see regime change. A regime change is just another way of saying the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our Lord. So what are we supposed to do? What are we, what's, what are we going to do right now? I mean, we've got to respond to what God is saying. What are we going to do right now? We have to train troops. They have to know the book. They have to be able to hear orders. They have to know how their weapons work. These are things that are necessary. You heard, you heard uh, Edgar talking about this from Nehemiah. Then we have to engage in the battle. You can't just be... Think of yourself as an officer who's sending, you're leading. Officers in our army lead from the front. Engage the enemy. Put the troops in the right places with the right weapons with the right time. We're going to keep up the air war because we want to continue to suppress the enemy and degrade his capabilities. But ultimately, until we can put boots on the ground, we're not going to see the transformation we want to see. But God is doing it. There are recruits out there you don't know yet. There's whole companies of people who are just waiting for someone to give them direction. God is doing it already. You see it all over the world. This is a time for battle. This is a time for the army of the Lord. Keep up the air war. Don't give up. But man, put boots on the ground. Because this is the time to see transformation and regime change in our cultures, in our societies, in our nations, in our businesses, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, even our government. You ready to fight? Stand up with me. Father, we re enlist right now. Thank you, Lord. We're ready to be deployed. Send us where we need to go, give us the troops that we can train. Give us the power and authority. Let us know your book and hear your orders. Let us see the regime change everywhere we go as we destroy the enemy and bring your peace. Your peace to everywhere we go. We're in the army of the Lord. We're doing your bidding. We're your servants. Make us know you so we can do all you called us to be and do. In Jesus' name.